II, a desperate time when humans found new and more terrible ways of killing each other. Out of this desperation came the Japanese suicide bomber known as the Kamikaze. To the Kamikaze, bomb and bomber were one and the same. They were willing to guide their planes into targets in the name of the emperor. They were told they'd become gods. Now for the first time in all color, a look at the men who were willing to embrace death and the devastation and agony they caused. These are the kamikazes. In the final 10 months of World War II, the empire of the rising sun was in dire circumstances. As a last ditch weapon, Japanese admirals and generals directed over 2,500 men to forfeit their lives as part of organized suicide missions. The world remembers them today collectively as kamikazes. The toll of the kamikazes was terrible. Scores of Allied ships were sunk or damaged beyond repair. Many more were damaged badly enough to take them out of the war. More than 7,000 Allied servicemen and women lost their lives due to the aerial suicide bombings from the advent of the kamikaze corps. Tens of thousands more were wounded, incredible suffering caused by just 2,500 kamikaze pilots, incalculable damage to families on all sides of the war. Girls and boys who lost their fathers, mothers whose sons would never come home. These kamikazes leave behind a bitter and tortured legacy they sacrificed themselves for an ideal, but in vain. Their name means divine wind. They were to blow back the invaders. The wind was strong, but did not prevail. How far the empire had fallen, but the beginning of the downfall was a full two years before the introduction of the kamikazes. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor stunned the world, American forces had rallied to prepare a global assault on the aggressor. Japanese pilots had sunk the heart of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, but missed precious aircraft carriers that were out to sea during the attack. Those flat tops would form the core of a counterattack meant to level the playing field in the Pacific. April 18, 1942, just five months after Pearl Harbor, Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle and his men take off from the aircraft carrier, the USS Hornet. Hitting targets in Tokyo, the 16 B-25s bring the war directly to the Japanese mainland. While not causing any real damage to the Japanese military, Doolittle's raid does inflict a severe blow to their once unwavering confidence. The Japanese realize if they do not soon destroy the remaining U.S. carriers and secure a larger defensive perimeter, more bombing raids on the Imperial City would come. Under the command of Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, a plan is devised to attack and capture the island base of Midway. 1,000 miles from Hawaii, 
Midway was a vital sentry point for the Americans stationed at Pearl Harbor. If the Japanese could take Midway, Pearl Harbor would soon be next, and ultimately, the coast of California. Yamamoto reasoned that an attack at Midway would draw out the remaining American fleet to defend it. With Japan's naval superiority, he felt assured not only of victory, but of once and for all administering a knockout blow that will eliminate the U.S. as a threat in the Pacific. The attack plan had all the earmarks of success. However, it would lack the one crucial advantage the Japanese had at Pearl Harbor, surprise. Unbeknownst to the Japanese, by early 1942, the Americans had broken most of their communication codes. In the spring of that year, intercepted Japanese transmissions were referring to a pending operation in which the target was codenamed AF. The only question for the Americans, what did AF stand for? Naval intelligence determined the most logical designation for AF must be Midway, but how to be sure? May 1942, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz orders Midway to send out urgent messages indicating that the island's water treatment plant had been damaged and that fresh water was needed immediately. The deception worked. Only days later, codebreakers monitored the following enemy transmission. AF is out of water. AF is out of water. Assured of the intended target, Admiral Nimitz called in his fleet. When the battle for Midway begins, three carriers, 14 destroyers, eight cruisers, and a host of airplanes all waiting for the rising sun. But while the U.S. forces would have surprise on their side, the numerical superiority was firmly with the Japanese, having four times the amount of naval and air forces. On the morning of June 4, 1942, 200 miles northwest of Midway, the Japanese carrier force, led under Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, moves forward and launches their planes to attack. Although the Americans knew ahead of time about the oncoming assault, Japanese fighters proved to be difficult targets as they swarmed down on the island. Black smoke filled the air as planes and oil tanks burned throughout the morning. It was a race against time as crewmen rushed to save whatever equipment and materials they could. Bombs were removed from airplanes in the hopes they wouldn't trigger even deadlier explosions in the hangars. The men on the ground were shooting rounds of anti-aircraft fire at incoming planes, but it was a difficult task against the Japanese Zeros, one of the quickest and most maneuverable fighters in the early stages of the war. The intense fighting foreshadowed the Japanese determination that would soon manifest into the kamikaze. The American counterattacks followed as fighters and torpedo bombers from Midway, as well as the aircraft carriers Enterprise, Hornet, and Yorktown stormed in on the Japanese fleet. At first, the battle was going in favor of the Japanese. The Zero fighters were winning the dogfights, and of 41 American torpedo bombers sent to sink the Japanese fleet that morning, only six came back with none scoring a hit. It appeared Yamamoto's victory would soon be at hand, but in a quick turn of luck and fate, the tides changed for the Americans. 
A group of American dive bombers had unexpectedly located the Japanese fleet, which included three aircraft carriers. Each of these carriers was full of planes, refueling and rearming for a second wave of attacks. The dive bombers fired direct hits that produced incredible explosions. As airplanes and munitions below decks detonated. Within 24 hours, several Japanese ships were out of commission and four aircraft carriers were at the bottom of the Pacific. By June 6th, just two days after their first strike, the Japanese were in full retreat. In the end, the battle cost the Japanese four carriers, 322 planes, and 3,500 men, including their best aviators. The defeat at Midway was the turning point in the Pacific War. For the first time in the war, Japan was on the defensive. Now that both sides were more evenly matched, the Japanese knew that they would have to change their strategy against the Americans. Yamamoto had spent time in the U.S. before the war and knew the Americans well. He had predicted that because of the U.S. industrial strength and capacities, Japan would have only six months after Pearl Harbor to finish off the Americans. Six months to the day after Pearl Harbor, Yamamoto was defeated at Midway. There is evidence that even this early in the war, to press the Allies into submission, some aides suggested using suicide ramming attacks in which the pilots would be sacrificed. But Admiral Yamamoto refused to listen. The rising sun had started to set. The humiliation of the first naval defeat for Japan since the 1500s caused the average Japanese citizen to wonder, perhaps for the first time, why they were fighting. We started hearing about the defeat at Midway from the carrier pilots. The more I heard their stories, the angrier I was. Not towards the enemy, but towards Vice Admiral Nagumo and his staff who took command. Yasunaga Hiroshi, pilot. In addition to the aircraft carriers which were saved from Pearl Harbor, the Americans developed faster and more maneuverable Essex-class carriers, which they were churning out at an astonishing pace. August 1942 at the island of Guadalcanal. Here the Japanese were building an airfield that would enable them to cut the critically important U.S.-Australian lifeline in the South Pacific. Led by General Alexander Vandergrift, the Marines were there to make sure that didn't happen. Coming ashore was easy as the Japanese fled to the interior of the island. By August 8th, the Americans had control of the airstrip. But taking the entire island would be much tougher for the Marines. They would have to overcome both the tenacious Japanese defenders and the sweltering jungle temperatures. At Guadalcanal, each side would pour in troops and materials to try to tip the balance in their favor. The Japanese finally withdrew from the island in January 1943. For the Allies, it was the first successful major offensive action of World War II. Baltic Sea. Death knows no prejudice. 
Kohe oks mul siin niimoodi tööl, et mis on siin vahi tull, püsti välja, 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 välja. The last 60 minutes of the worst maritime disaster in Europe that killed 852 passengers and crew. Zero hour. The sinking of the Estonia. Premieres tonight on Discovery Channel. Every culture across the globe has a dragon's legend. People that could have never spoken to one another shared visions of the same creature. Unless, of course, dragons were real. Dragons, a fantasy made real. Premier Sunday, February 12th on Discovery Channel. What's better, a Ferrari or a Porsche? That's a smile on my face. A Ducati or a Y2K? Why would you put a jet engine in a motorcycle? Because we can. A Spitfire or a Mustang? Ferociously fast. Will you agree with our panel of experts? Awesome. Legend number one. As they have the final word on the greatest machines ever built. The greatest ever. Thursday night on Discovery Channel. Discover. Precise planning. They were well organized, well armed. They had this ideological strength that made them more influential. Absolute chaos. The shards of glass from the front of the building coming through and slicing through my head and through my body. Discover supernatural thrills. We know that evil exists in the world. Paranormal chills. I could sense that someone was there. Discover the will to survive. And I can feel the power of the river. I cannot breathe. I feel I'm dying. The ultimate sacrifice. Deep down, we both knew that it was the only thing we could really do. Discover the human limit. Throughout 1942 and 1943, U.S. forces moved ever closer to Tokyo. The importance of air superiority was so keenly felt that the Japanese Navy's Air Fleet Commander-in-Chief, Takajiro Onishi, committed the heresy of suggesting that they scrap the pride of the fleet, the Yamato, and use the metal to build airplanes. lack of airplanes wasn't the only problem. The Japanese needed people who could fly. On June 19, 1944, in what has come to be known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, the Empire of the Rising Sun lost ten times as many planes as the Allies. When the smoke cleared, Japan had few planes or pilots left. And while more planes could be built, trained and talented aviators were not so easy to replace. As the Allies continued their island hopping campaign, the Imperial Armed Forces found themselves in increasingly dire straits. The Mitsubishi Zero, which had ruled the skies at the beginning of the war, could not go as high or as fast as the new American fighters. Very soon, the U.S. forces would be close enough to threaten the home islands. Meanwhile, in Europe, the Allies had already made their D-Day landing in Normandy and were moving on to liberate Paris. After that, it would be on to Berlin. Hitler was in serious trouble, and Japan was facing up to the possibility that it might lose the first war in its history and it had no friends left to help it. It was a bitter pill that the Emperor's military leaders were not ready to swallow. With the Axis crumbling, it would soon be Japan versus the rest of the world. This was the situation as the American task forces assembled in October 1944 in Leyte Gulf off the Philippines. 
If the Allies took back the Philippines, it would only be a matter of time until they took Formosa, Okinawa, Kyushu, and the main island itself. The Japanese countered with a plan, the show or victory operation, to repel the invaders. Several military leaders argued that, just for this campaign, the use of ramming attack should be employed. The most vocal was Air Fleet Commander-in-Chief Takajiro Onishi. In the 21st century, we have become used to technology like heat-seeking missiles and smart bombs. But in those days, bombs and torpedoes were dropped with only the hope that they would hit the intended target. The Allies would drop three and four times the amount of bombs necessary to disable a target, knowing that much of the bomb load would not hit the intended objective. The Japanese military simply didn't have those kinds of resources. But what if every hit counted, reasoned Onishi? What if the bomb could be guided so that each and every one reached its target every time? One airplane, one ship went the theory. But the theory needed to be proven. Rear Admiral Masafumi Arima decided that he was just the man for the job. He boarded his plane and didn't stop until he found an aircraft carrier. The crew of the USS Franklin watched in astonishment as he got closer and closer. Maybe the pilot was dead and had lost control. Still, it looked like he was aiming for the deck. Arima slammed into the Franklin. The date was October 13, 1944. Thousands more would follow him over the next 10 months. The kamikaze, the divine wind, was born. No one could have predicted that the wind would soon become a full-fledged storm. The first Divine Wind squads were formed in October of 1944 and based out of Clark Airfield in the Japanese-occupied Philippines. They were officially dubbed the Special Attack Force. Upon the decision to form the unit, Air Fleet Commander-in-Chief Takajiro Onishi called for volunteers from the flyers in the 201st Air Group who were not family men. Japan is in grave danger. Thus, on behalf of your hundred million countrymen, I ask you this sacrifice and pray for your success. I shall watch your efforts to the end and report your deeds to the throne. The entire unit volunteered. They would fly their missions until none of them were left. Onishi swore to follow them. These volunteers were a tremendous roadblock to the Allies' plans to take the Philippines back. As the Battle of Leyte Gulf began on October 22nd, fear and panic reigned on the American side because indeed there was little defense against the new kamikaze squads. At first they were believed to be ordinary pilots with engine trouble trying to do some extra damage. But as the numbers increased, the reality sunk in. An innovation of this battle is the suicide dive. A countermeasure must be found soon. Captain Ray Tarbuck, senior naval representative to General MacArthur. Unlike a high altitude bombing run, the kamikaze strike was almost a personal assault, an aviator's version of hand-to-hand -hand combat. I can still see his helmet, goggles, and face as the plane and pilot sank into the sea. Tommy Alexander, USS Princeton. Even when they missed, Japanese special attack fighters got closer to their prey than ever before. Here, the crew of the USS Essex watches in horror as the pilot follows his plane into the water. 
We didn't see him until he was about 8,000 yards away. This one came in low and fast, and how he ever got through all the stuff we threw at him, I'll never know. But he did. Lieutenant Harry Stanley, Gunnery Officer, USS Bush. Sailors could often inspect what was left of the plane, and many times the pilot's body, after the crash. Ironically, these pilots, who had done their best to kill everyone on the ship, were sometimes buried with full military honors. The last 60 minutes of the worst maritime disaster in Europe that killed 852 passengers and crew. Zero hour. The sinking of the Estonia. Premieres tonight on Discovery Channel. This is a land of extremes and contrasts. A home to a diversity of wildlife where the most unique and weirdest animals and plants live in some of the toughest but most beautiful landscapes imaginable. Wild Australasia premieres tomorrow night on Discovery Channel. Deep in the Carpathian Mountains an amazing discovery has been made. A completely intact, perfectly preserved body has been found. A creature that we've always believed was a legend may have actually existed. Dragons, a fantasy made real, premieres Sunday, February 12th on Discovery Channel. We're ready, crew. What's better, a Ferrari or a Porsche? That's a smile on my face. A Ducati or a Y2K? Why would you put a jet engine in a motorcycle? Because we can. A Spitfire or a Mustang? Ferociously fast. Will you agree with our panel of experts? Awesome. Legend number one. As they have the final word on the greatest machines ever built. The greatest ever. Thursday night on Discovery Channel. Honda presents Animal Planet Insights in February. A giant's point of view. Television. Once thought extinct, Bhutan the Lost Dragon. Worshipped and defiled, sacred animals of the pharaohs. A lifelong mission of love. They call him Chantek. Every Sunday night on Honda Presents, Animal Planet Insights in February. These programs brought to you by Honda, the power of dreams. Within Japan, the method of attack was hailed as the ultimate secret weapon, a new and glorious invention in the art of war. The Knights of the Divine Wind were cheered as saviors and as gods. The Kamikaze Corps guards the imperial nation and has admirably demonstrated the pure hearts of the Japanese. Radio Tokyo, October 28, 1944. One mother wrote to her child in the Corps, You are my son, and you are not my son. You are the son of the Emperor. U.S. admirals agonized over what to do about the suicide bombers. The commander-in-chief of Pacific Operations, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, was so taken aback, he ordered a news blackout of the development. A total embargo against any mention of suicide bombers was strictly enforced. After all, how could they tell the mothers and wives back home that the enemy had a new weapon, one that could only be stopped when Japan ran out of pilots? Japanese Air Fleet Commander Onishi realized that there was great support among the U.S. public for the war but he also gambled that the kamikazes would terrify the Americans into negotiating a truce. 
The U.S. news embargo was proof that Onishi was onto something. This article goes out of its way to suppress the emerging rumors, saying the suicide pilot was already dead. The real truth was too horrible to reveal. Navy gunners knew how to aim at the broad underbelly of enemy planes, which they had dubbed with colorful names like Oscar and Val. But a plane diving down right above you is much harder to hit with anti-aircraft artillery. This fact allowed the Japanese special attack forces to inflict severe damage on Allied ships as the Battle of Leyte Gulf raged on during October 1944. The method was so revolutionary that U.S. anti-aircraft guns had to be reconfigured to prevent them from hitting their own superstructure. From the beginning, there were two main plans of attack employed by the Divine Wind. The first, favored by Air Fleet Commander-in-Chief Onishi, involved flying toward the target at a very low altitude, right above the waves, in order to evade radar. With the target ship in sight, the aviator would gain altitude in order to build up speed for the final plunge. The second method, favored by the Japanese Army Air Force, which soon formed its own special attack force, worked best when there was heavy cloud cover. It called for the pilot to climb to extreme heights and then come down at an angle as the target ship came in range. Either way, these were far from the spur of the moment attacks the Allies first thought they were witnessing. About the best that the gunners could hope to do was throw all the ak, -ak artillery they could at a plane until it either disintegrated or fell into the sea and out of harm's way. The pilots were instructed to aim for the flat top elevators. In many ways, the elevator was the heart of the carrier. Thus, a blow to the lifts would cause the maximum damage since it would take out as many airplanes as possible in the hangar and at the same time make normal flight operations including storing and moving the aircraft impossible. Others were told to take out the decks that served as the floating tarmac for these mobile air bases. Because the Americans used wooden decks, even a glancing blow could shut the ship down for weeks. Even if the ship itself went undamaged, the planes on deck were also a valuable target. Because the carriers stored ammunition and fuel for their aircraft, and because the Japanese special attack planes were equipped with 550-pound bombs themselves, the high-velocity dives caused violent explosions. the kind of decimation that Air Fleet Commander-in-Chief Onishi had hoped for. In fact, the Zero fighter's downfall, the reason it had been derided as a gas tank with wings, made it a very effective suicide bomb. Its lack of armor almost guaranteed explosion on impact, and the more fuel aboard, the better. Overpowering fires often ensued. Only the skill and bravery of the damage control parties kept the casualty numbers from being catastrophic. After the fire came the back-breaking duty of cleaning up. Often the water and foam used to put out the fires did their own harm to the ship's equipment. To the pilots of the Divine Wind, the only thing more harrowing than the prospect of dying was the prospect of not dying. Not being able to find the enemy ships. In such cases, the flyers were told to return to base and prepare for sure death on another day. 
No one can know the psychological torture that produced. We lined up, our heads hanging in front of the commandant. He said simply, it can be helped, a pity, but you will have another opportunity to destroy the aircraft carriers. We looked at one another in silence. Nagatsuka Ryuji, Japanese Army Air Force. After a task force was sighted, the kamikazes would typically fly in a formation of five to 10 aircraft with just a few of the planes earmarked for sure death missions. The others were there to provide cover so that the newly appointed gods would increase their chances of reaching the target. They were also there to document and report the results for transmission to the emperor. Historians have later suggested that the escort also served to ensure that none of the pilots would try to break their date with destiny. To further baffle the enemy, the kamikaze squads would make it a policy to ride in behind a returning group of friendlies. American radar was sophisticated, but it wasn't sophisticated enough to sort out who was who. Although dusk was a particularly auspicious time for a kamikaze mission, suicide runs could happen at any time of day or night. The number one instruction more important than where and how to attack, was stated best by one Japanese special attack commander. He told his flyers, come back dead. In just the first few days of the Battle of Leyte, nearly every US aircraft carrier in the task group off of the Philippine Islands had been hit by the new suicide divers. On the third day of the battle, October 25th, 1944, Another wave of kamikazes was launched against Task Force 77 near the island of Samar. The final pilot of the squad, thought to be Lieutenant Yukio Seki, put the escort carrier the St. Lowe in his sights and crash dove on the deck. These paintings by the brother of one of the St. Lowe's gunners tell the story. At first, the damage to the escort or jeep carrier as the converted merchant vessels were known, didn't seem too serious until the bomb carried by the kamikaze detonated in the hangar deck, causing the aircraft fuel to ignite. To make matters worse, the sprinkler system failed. The fire raged out of control as torpedoes, depth charges, and other bombs exploded from the heat. Eight heavy explosions followed, flinging men into the ocean. It also opened gaping holes where the flat top took on water. Captain F.J. McKenna prepared to abandon ship. A second wave of bogies, primarily Yokosuka dive bombers, arrived just 20 minutes later, and the combat air patrol had all it could do to keep those at bay. Finally, an escort cruiser put out the St. Lowe's fires, but it was too late. Ten minutes after the fires went out, the St. Lowe went to the bottom. The first sinking due to a suicide mission. The St. Lowe lost 114 men that day. Another 784 were rescued from the treacherous waters. Many men in the water cried as they saw their homes slide under the waves. The dream of the kamikaze's originators, one plane, one ship, had come true. The Corps was so successful, and the Japanese situation still so tenuous, that it was too compelling to stop with the defense of the Philippines as planned. Ramming attacks were so powerful, they could almost be described as addictive. The divine wind was here to stay. and contrasts, a home to a diversity of wildlife, where the most unique and weirdest animals and plants live in some of the toughest 
but most beautiful landscapes imaginable. Wild Australasia premieres tomorrow night on Discovery Channel. Discover precise planning. They were well organized, well armed. They had this ideological strength that made them more influential. Absolute chaos. The shards of glass from the front of the building coming through and slicing through my head and through my body. Discover supernatural thrills. We know that evil exists in the world. Paranormal chills. I could sense that someone was there. Get out of my house! Do you hear me? Get out of my house! <laughs> Discover the will to survive. And I can feel the power of the river. I cannot breathe. I feel me I'm dying. The ultimate sacrifice. Deep down we both knew that it was the only thing we could really do. Discover the human limit. In the icy cold of the Baltic Sea, death knows no prejudice. Kohaks mul siin niimoodi tööle, et mis sa siin vahid, ull, püsti, välja, 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 välja. The last 60 minutes of the worst maritime disaster in Europe that killed 852 passengers and crew. Zero hour. The sinking of the Estonia. Premieres tonight on Discovery Channel. Animal Planet's lessons on pet care. Pets are artistic. Get creative. Pets are neurotic. Manage their fears. Pets get stressed. Give them a massage. Still unsure on how to handle them? Here's a series that will keep you clued in on what you'd need to know about your pets. Pittsburgh Weekends on Animal Planet. How were so many compelled to give up everything for the sake of a falling empire? These pilots were the newest embodiment of a divine wind that had protected the island of Japan for centuries. The year 1281, Kublai Khan has decided that the Mongolian Empire should expand to the islands of Japan. The head of the Japanese military, the Shogun, has other ideas. The Mongols amass a huge army on the Chinese and Korean coasts, ready to invade. Badly outnumbered, the Japanese warriors wonder how long they can fend off the enemy. Then, a typhoon arrives, destroying the invading armada and saving Japan. The storm is attributed to the sun goddess. The tale has been told to every Japanese schoolboy and girl since. This event took place as the feudal system in Japan was developing. Among the powerful castes at the time were the samurai, the warrior class, who essentially ruled the country until the 19th century. Also during this time, the samurai developed an unwritten code, which came to be called Bushido. Bushido called for bravery and athletic prowess, but above all else, allegiance to the emperor, who was regarded as a god on earth. The architects of the kamikaze squads called on these centuries-old traditions. They invoked the words of the Emperor Meiji from the 1880s. Bear in mind that duty is weightier than a mountain, while death is as light as a feather. The Knights of the Divine Wind were instilled with religious duty. While religious freedom was espoused in Japan, Shinto practices were expected of every citizen, and especially of every soldier, including the recognition of the emperor as a god on earth. All of this came together in the kamikaze farewell ritual. The commander would toast the pilots with sake rice wine, a present from the emperor. 
The pilots were guaranteed a place at the Yasukuni Shrine, a posthumous promotion in rank, and to have their exploits mentioned to Emperor Hirohito. See you at the shrine was a popular farewell as pilots jumped into their planes for their one-way missions. Japan was a refined culture, of which these pilots were rightfully proud. They were told by their superiors that their sacrifice was the only way to preserve that culture, the only way to preserve their very homes. The security, the very existence of our families was threatened. Women, children and old men had already been among the innumerable and pathetic victims of bombing and machine gun fire. It was therefore natural that we should go to any length regardless of our own safety to protect our families. Nagatsuka Ryuji, Japanese Army Air Force. Before heading out on a mission, the men would write a final letter home. The letters have a haunting quality. I precede you now, mother, in the approach to heaven. Pray for me, mother. Ensign Hayashi Ichizo. Don't be envious of your friend's daddies. Your daddy has become a god and is always watching you. Lieutenant Colonel Kuno Masanobu. Dear Moko, grew up to be a healthy and big girl. Daddy will make an attack on the enemies. When you grow up, you will understand. Lieutenant Umemura Masahisa. But why would these militarists even think to sacrifice their best and brightest? If your hands are broken, fight with your feet. If your feet are broken, fight with your teeth. If there is no breath left in your body, fight with your ghost. General Sakurai Tokutaro. As the ships in the Leyte Gulf prepared to commence the largest naval battle in history, General MacArthur made his triumphant landing on Philippine territory. It had been a grueling year and a half since the Japanese occupied the Philippines in the wake of their success at Pearl Harbor, and General MacArthur, forced off the island, vowed, I shall return. Finally, on October 20th, 1944, he was able to make good on his promise. However, it would be months until he was able to end Japanese occupation of all the Philippine Islands. As the Allies continued to press through the scattered Philippines from late October past the New Year, kamikazes attacked the ships in the Lingayen Gulf in an effort to stave off the invasion of the island of Luzon, home of the Philippine capital, Manila. The lower admirals implored the U.S. Pacific commander, Admiral Nimitz, to order raids on the airfield from which these aerial assaults were originating, but resources were already spread thin. One of those admirals, William Bull Halsey, who headed the Kamikaze Vulnerable Third Fleet, prevailed, and carrier planes began working over Japanese-controlled Clark Field and the other suspected air bases. Unfortunately, Japanese mechanics had become masters at hiding the aircraft in the nearby jungles and constructing decoys to park on the field. The U.S. bombed many Zeros during those months, not realizing that many of them were mere plywood mock-ups. It would be some time before Allied planners would catch on. To them, it just seemed that somehow the kamikazes kept coming and coming. As did the carnage. On October 30th, three fleet carriers near the Philippine island of Cebu took serious hits. Gas fires raged on the Intrepid, 
but the fearless control team tackled the blaze swiftly and skillfully. The damage to the Franklin, which was the first carrier to be hit by a kamikaze just two weeks before, was the worst of the three, but casualties were relatively light. The dead and wounded on the Bellow Wood were a different story. 92 men perished. Another 54 were seriously injured. Both the Franklin and the Bellow Wood had to be taken out of the war for repairs. Through October and November, highly prized fleet carriers like the Lexington, the Essex, the Hancock, as well as nearly every one of the smaller escort carriers had fallen prey to the Japanese special attack forces in the Philippines. Tension mounted on board as the crew began to feel like sitting ducks. As the new year approached, both sides prayed for an end to the war on their own terms. The Japanese prayed for the invaders to be repelled by their gods of the divine wind. And the Allies prayed that the Emperor would realize the folly of continuing a war that he could not win. Both sides would have to wait for an answer to their prayers. The year went out on a terrible note as a typhoon blew in on December 17th, as if to repeat the divine wind from which the kamikazes took their name. It found Halsey's fleet, and however he tried to evade it, it seemed to follow him. The fleet floundered, losing more than 800 men. A lull in the suicide raids allowed the Americans to lick their wounds, but not for long. Desperate for targets, and dreading returning to base without completing their missions, the kamikaze started threatening smaller ships. And as 1944 became 1945, the assaults heated up once more. Those smaller ships bore the brunt of the renewed Japanese vengeance. December 28, 1944. Here a cameraman, caught in full-fledged kamikaze assault, doesn't know where to point his camera. He just missed a suicide plane slamming into the ammunition ship, the USS John Burke. The Burke was destroyed in seconds with the loss of every single man on board. Eventually, the American CAPs, or combat air patrols, got better and better at intercepting the kamikazes. But on the afternoon of January 6th, several suicide flyers and their escorts managed to sneak through to the ships in the Lingayen Gulf that were helping to shake the rest of the Japanese out of the Philippines. The Japanese special attackers went right for the flagship of the task force, the battleship New Mexico. A fully loaded Zero smashed directly into the bridge. Unlike other kinds of combat, the naval commanders were often as much in the line of fire as the lowliest grunt on board. And that was never more true than during a kamikaze attack. Although Vice Admiral Jesse Oldendorf was not injured, the captain of the ship was killed, along with a leading aide to Great Britain's Winston Churchill. A correspondent from Time magazine was also among the dead. This first major attack of the year filled both sides with a sense of dread. What would the rest of 1945 bring? It would be the final year of the kamikazes.
the dramatic final 60 minutes that changed reality. The countdown is back. Zero Hour. New episodes tonight on Discovery Channel. Every culture across the globe has a dragon's legend. People that could have never spoken to one another shared visions of the same creature. Unless, of course, dragons were real. Dragons, a fantasy made real. Premier Sunday, February 12th on Discovery Channel. This is a land of extremes and contrasts. A home to a diversity of wildlife. Where the most unique and weirdest animals and plants live in some of the toughest but most beautiful landscapes imaginable. Wild Australasia premieres tomorrow night on Discovery Channel. Off the eastern shores of the island of Honshu is one of the most beautiful places in Japan the Bay of Matsushima. The bay is studded with more than 260 pine-covered islands. These islands of pine are revered by the Japanese because the pine tree is a channel through which the gods descend to earth. During the Japanese New Year, pine trees are put in front of people's homes to invite the gods to join in the festivities. When the celebrated Japanese poet Basho saw Matsushima, he marveled. O oh, great creator of the universe, what man could presume to describe this place in words? To the Japanese, Matsushima is more than a national treasure. It is a resplendent gift from the gods. Discovery Channel. The most important space shuttle mission in NASA history, where failure could mean the end of human space exploration for the US. Space Shuttle Countdown to Combat. Ambitions, money, and fraught tempers. The people behind the building of the largest architectural projects of our time. Kings of construction. It has left its mark in folklore, but what if legends are true? A scientific exploration of a creature that never existed. Dragons, a fantasy made real. Extraordinary perseverance in unimaginable situations. Survivors relive their death-defying experiences in I Shouldn't Be Alive. February on Discovery Channel. What if your family lived in a home on an island you couldn't leave? With limited amounts of food and safe drinking water,